these more more of these. I can find them. I have to find them with the no copyright issues. I don't know, but uh, and find ones that have you know simple arrangements with the words where you can see them clearly. But we will get them. We will get them. So we'll dedicate several from time to time Shabbatot with that kind of music theme. So today, 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 we'll take over control here of the, the reins. This hand is on the one. Where am I? Here we go. So I wanted to continue with the question, you know, what makes us as Jews? So we said, well, we've got the Bible. We talked about that. That would be that. We said the people. Well, okay, the people get in the center. The Jewish people, concept of the peoplehood, concept of a common origin, a common destiny, a common uh, fate interwound of all of us. All Israel are tied in, liable for each other. So the next thing is the Torah. And so I talk briefly, what is our Torah, the written Torah? Now the question is, what makes us different from the Christians who share basically the same Torah with us, the same written Torah? And it is our understanding of the Torah. It is our methodology. That is what makes us different. Torah Shabbat Peh. Besides that, we don't have the amendments that they have. Torah Shabbat Peh, the oral Torah, that which is transmitted from student to, from master to student. Uh, as the Pirkei Avot will say, God gave Moses the Torah at Sinai, and Sinai, Moses transmitted to Joshua, Joshua the elders, and they to the Nevi'im, and to the uh, members of the great Knesset, to the rabbis, and so on. Chain of tradition, very important. So the key idea and understanding is that starting with the Bible, and for Jews later, everything is a question, right? Let's think, when God confronts Adam, when he's in trouble for the first time, he doesn't say, Adam, you did this. He says, where are you? Ayeka, question, where are you? Later on, when Cain is disappointed because God didn't like his offering, God doesn't say, you pick yourself up. He says, Lama, Lama Haralha, why, why are you upset? Why are you dying? Right? Question, question, question. And then when Cain actually kills his brother, he, he doesn't say, you killed your brother. He says, question mark. Hey, where's your brother? Question. And of course, then we get the Jewish classic, biblical repartee. Am I responsible? He asks the question. I answer with a question. Right? And then God answers him with a question. Ma'asita, what did you do? Question, question, question. So from the first man, and woman, all the way down, it's all questions. This is very characteristic. So even the foundation of classic Judaism is a book called, known as the Mishnah. It's our basis for all the Jewish practice that we have. So it opens up, and every Talmud has always Mishnah in it. And then after section Mishnah is the commentary, discussion on it. That is what we call the Gemara conclusion. So you open up a Mishnah, and the very first one, you would expect it to tell you something. Information, no. Me'ematai, question mark. When? When do I begin? Me'ematai. When do I begin to say the Shema in the evening? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do I know I'm supposed to say the Shema at all? You know it. I don't have to tell you that. I have to elucidate things you don't know. So I have to do it in the question form of a question. You don't have to tell me what I know already. You have to clarify for me what I don't know. So then, of course, like all good Jews, I get two different answers. From what time may one recite this from the evening? From the time the priests enter their houses and are the room until the end of the first watch. Words of Rabbi Eliezer. The sages say till midnight. Rabbi Gamaliel says until the first ray of dawn, three different answers. Notice this with the sing song, because when you're learning, you learn better when you sing, right? Another thing that the rabbis discovered. Memorization goes well with melody. So it is this concept of Torah Shabbat Peh, a way of analyzing, tearing apart text, but not like modern literature is deconstructed where it's torn apart and has no meaning. 
but we're seeking certain torn parts so that we put it together in a direction we know in the advanced direction we're going to go to. All right? We're going to, we may break apart the paths, but we know where we're headed. And that makes it different from contemporary literary, literary techniques. So this is was in as they considered so radical that the Roman Empire, after seeing the uprising of Bar Kokhba, influenced by the rabbis, inspired by Rabbi Akiva and others, right, was very afraid of the impact of the oral teachings of the Torah. They did not ban the teaching of the Bible. They banned the teachings of the interpretation of the Bible because they saw that in that was something dangerous to the empire, more than the text of the Bible itself. They use the term deuterosis, the teaching of the, the same word as Deuteronomy, repetition of the Torah. So where does this start? Well, we can presume that even with the first temple, while the texts still are being put together that will make up the Bible, there are already schools that are enlarging upon the written word or the oral word. So we have terms like b'nei nevi'im, the children of the prophets. We mean those people who gathered around a tzaddik, a righteous man, or Ishaloki, the man of God, or, or, or Navi, and they would record the teachings and transmit them to others. Again, orally or in writing. Certainly when the children of Israel come back to the land of Israel under the scribe of Ezra, he institutes a formal public reading of the Torah, and then he adds to it the translation into the language of people, which is Aramaic. And when you have a translation, there's also explanation. And the practice of reading line by line Hebrew and Aramaic still continues till modern times among Jews of Yemen and is given to a child of preschool age to, to chant correctly with the proper notations, both the musical and the vocalization. So, and it's essential because the Torah itself is very skimpy about what we're supposed to do. On Shabbat, we have very, very few specific commands about what's permitted, what's forbidden. And so, it is in this period that we begin to flesh out, for example, Shabbat, during the time of the persecution of religious Jews by Antiochus and his henchmen. The very pious would die rather than defend themselves on Shabbat. The Maccabees introduced the idea that the saving of life and self-defense was essential in order to preserve the Shabbat. It goes back to the Maccabees, that one, for example. Other rules of Shabbat, the Torah says, do not go out of your habitations. Does it really mean we stay put inside the door and lock the door? Torah says you shall not have fire burning on Shabbat. Doesn't mean we sit in the dark. Some Jews said yes. Others said no. So we have practices that come out of us, like lighting fire before Shabbat, lighting Hanukkah lights, not in the Torah, reading the Megillah is not in the Torah. It catches on. But they need to be justified in a basis in the written Torah. And so we now need scholars who can make the connection between what we are practicing and where is the source, right? You can't just take a practice and say, well, it's, I mean, you can. They do say things like Takanat Sofim, the, 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 the scribes decreed it, but you want to still have a basis on it. So we have the rise of schools. And again, always pairs because you're going to have disagreements. Zugot, the most famous of them, we always report in the time of Julius Caesar, Hillel and Shabbai. Not everybody hears about Hillel and Shabbai, Hillel and Shabbai, back and forth. And the very first of the teachers have no titles. It's only after Hillel we see the title rabbi or rabban, my teacher or our teacher or master. So authority also in this period is taken away from prophets. Prophecy dies out completely in this period of the second temple. Uh, at the return, a few, the Malachi and so on, uh, is one of the last that's recognized. And they say that prophecy is taken from the Prophets, and it's now given to children and the insane. And nobody else is going to come in and tell us anything from heaven. And the Talmud even records a debate of the rabbis, and the voice from heaven says, So and so is right. And the rabbi says, It's not your business. Why no, is it not your business? We have the Torah already. Loba Shemaimhi. Heaven no longer has the Torah. We have it. Right? This transfer of authority to the human. To the, to the educated human, who has a goal and purpose, not to an, a nihilistic or a anarchistic, right? But to a first person with dedication. So, of course, we always have three, not two, but three lines of study 
within the mains, we'll call the mainstream of Judaism. And we were going to talk about them. There are other streams of outside the mainstream. There are the Sadducees, which are the school of the priests. So they want to remain close to the text as possible. It's their business. Sacrifice, purity, that's their business. So they want to emphasize that role. And then you have the interpretive roles out of the Pharisees, the strict constructions approach like Shammai, and the looser liberal constructions like Hillel. And when you read Jesus' words in Christian scriptures, either it's not, either it's Jesus or it's Christians who are familiar <coughs> with the practices of his day, because that's about uh, the, the text is, <coughs> begins to be unified in Christian sources several decades after, but we have the debate about washing hands before meals, <coughs> about may one pick grains of wheat as one's walking through a field on Shabbat. They want to heal the ill on Shabbat. And so they're mentioned there. And then because the Jews are debating it and they're reflecting that. And one of the interesting thoughts is that Jesus is actually calling his followers to be as strict as the Pharisees. And he's attacking the Pharisees very much because the, in the same similar camps. It's just as communists fought more against socialists than against fascists. You fight hardest with those close to you. So we also have this pretty new theology the resurrection of the dead. It appears in the book of Maccabees, where I actually find that maybe the first reference. Olam Haba, the idea of the next life, as opposed to just resurrection, some kind of world in which the spirits... It's all coming to development in this period. They're concepts. They're rejected by the Sadducees, by the way, priestly class. We have the development of the concept of Yemot Mashiach, a little bit more explicit. The Bible has references, but not direct. Now is the period, all the literature that's coming out. How do we envision it? Is it political? Is it existential? Is it something that changes all of existence as we know? That's all coming out in this world. And we keep on with this competing pairs also, during the mission into the Talmud. So another very famous pair that are at large, they're friends and they're worlds apart. Rabbi Ishmael uses the methods of logical analysis, Shloshes Remidot, at the beginning of a prayer book. He uses that. Rabbi Akiva says, no, 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 don't leave me with that. I'm going to work, look at the gaps between the words and the ex useless words like ach, be'at, that don't have a really solid function in Hebrew anymore. And those are going to be my clues. And I use it like driving a truck through a wall. All right, I use that. All right, different, completely different. And yet they're both partners. And we have these earliest collections. And before the Mishnah, we have Mechilta, Sifra, Sifra. And they go around the portion of the week. OK, finally, and this is a, 70 years or so after Bar Kokhba, or well over 100 years since the temple is destroyed. And one rabbinic authority is powerful enough, Yud on the sea, And he's connected to the Roman emperor. Times are relatively better. Of the Jews in the land of Israel, he has the clout to create a formal compendium. That's the Mishnah. And that becomes the core work for all Jews uh, around, eventually as it spreads around the entire Jewish world outside the land of Israel as well. And for the first time, instead of going by portion of the week, it goes organized by themes, agriculture, festival, women, damages, and so on. And then those orders, say there, are broken down into themes Masechet collections, and you have Shabbat, and you have court Sanhedrin. So, and again, they're still going in pairs because rather than having one decision, there are two alternatives always. And then you have a lot of work that is outside Baraita, which is external external text, Tosefta, which is a compendium like the Mishnah. So, no sooner is the ink dry on the page, then new issues arise, right? Land of Israel, Jews in the land of Israel have certain needs. Jews in Babylonia who are much wealthier and more powerful have different needs. So we have to discuss what are those needs there as opposed to needs here. And again, as always, we have two different sets of discussion. The academies in both lands are competing, Israel and Babylonia. We have in Israel creation of a shorter companion discussion, Talmud Yerushalmi or Palestinian Talmud. 
And that's much shorter because there's much more oppression under the Christian emperors and economy is bad, money is that bad. And so the funding to really pursue is not there. In Babylonia, wealthier, more tolerant, generally Persians or Estrian, generally more tolerant. They have more time to develop the text and hence much more extensive and longer, the Bavli, all right? And because of their position, eventually it is their text that takes over in terms of importance around the world. And, but it's always in pairs, debating Rav and Shmuel Abayi Rava and competing academies, Sur and Pumbadita. This says this, this says this. And you have the new legal figure, Rav, right? We have Rabbi, Rabbi, or it becomes Rabbi. And here you have Rav. And the distinction between the two, that the scholars of the land of Israel wouldn't accord the scholars of Babylonia the honor of deciding if cattle were of the right age for being offered in sacrifice. And of course, sacrifice had disappeared already for more than 100 years. So it's a theoretical distinction. Um, Rav. So actually, the correct term used outside after that is Rav and not Rabbi, technically. So we have these Amoraim. These are the scholars who are now composing for us what becomes the Talmud and the final editing, Savoraim, the reasoners. And here is, for example, this is down here, picture of the Roshami, a nice print edition. It's, uh, I don't know how many volumes it's in, but it's about eight, nine volumes. And here the Bavli, uh, you have, I don't know, this is about 20 volumes, right? And not only that, but if you ever open a Bavli, it's not only the edition, it's the commentaries. There's commentaries before, there's commentaries on the side, top and bottom, and the back of the book is filled with a, all sorts of codes that are built around the text of the Talmud and then corrections to the text of the Talmud and the Seftas and on and on and on and on. Okay. And then, as I say, so somewhere around the year 400, 500, the Bavli is finished as we have it and we get new problems, right? What, what is our prayer book? We have general rules about the prayer book in the Talmud, but what is the prayer? So now we have to formalize well, what is now the final accepted collective prayer. So we go to the time of Rav Amram Gaon, somewhere around 800, uh, and he is the head of the academy. Gaon meaning the illustrious one, uh, head of the academy, uh, as opposed to Resh Galuta, head of the exile, the political leader. Now uh, we have the creation of this prayer book. Uh, that one becomes the basis for the Sephardic prayer book. Later on, there is the Machzor Vitri, becomes the basis of the Ashkenazi prayer book. Well, we have new questions. There are different conditions. Different conditions under Christians. There are different conditions under Zoroastrians. There are different conditions under Muslim rulers. So we have communities now spread as far as Spain and India sending questions to the academies, what we call Shailot questions, and getting answers, Shuvot. So Shailot and Shuvot respond back and forth. And we have thousands and thousands and thousands of these still archived. We do. Um, and many of them are available online now. That's been a big project on a part of the university. So we also have to solidify well, what are our beliefs? How do we get to beliefs? Talmudic analysis for law is very straight logic analysis, verbal analysis, one, if, if then, if then, and so on. Uh, when we come to beliefs, it's more poetic, it's more a flow of. Uh, a stream of consciousness type thinking. Uh, we have compendium of rabbinic sermons, legends, tales. They're usually built around the portion of the week, Midrash Haggadah, as opposed to Midrash Halakha, teaching of story, recitations, let's say Agadah, you talk about. And then we also have the development of philosophical thought. Start with Philo, but then in line with Greek thought, especially under the Muslim, Sa'ad Yaga'on, Rambam. We have the development of mystical speculation, where we break away from the plain text and filled with flights of imagination like the Zohar. And we also have now to comprehend the Torah, the development of commentaries to explain the Torah as we're reading on Shabbat morning in the light of what we know as Jews based on the Talmud later. So we have Rashi and Ibn Ezra and Ramban, and the Jewish world now is, is bigger. As I say, Gibraltar is extending actually all the way to the borders of China. And we have so much literature 
and more, and we have more compendia to, and we need to organize all of this material. So we have Al Fasi and Rabbi Asher and the Tur, Shulchan Aruch for the becomes the core code for Sfardim, and then the Ashkenazim say it's missing what we want. Shulchan Aruch meaning a table, it's missing the tablecloth. We provide a tablecloth, we get the Ashkenazi practice, Sfardic and Ashkenazi practice. That's coming down to 1500s and so on down to our times. Finally, so those are what we consider, right? Our oral companion. But Torah is also method. Torah is method. Torah hi lemoda nitzarich. It is Torah and I need to study, which means that the students would study and observe the rabbi in his actions, the teacher, including even in bed and in the bathroom. There is no modesty. Torah hi lemoda nitzarich. The Hasidim, by the way, keep up that practice at some point. They did. Okay. So any movement that is a study-based movement, a learning-based movement, would by nature be elitist. But what happens to the Pharisees, who start out as an elite group, and that's part of the tension that you can see in the New Testament, they become a populist, popular movement. Instead of looking down on the masses, which is what happens with educated people, they recognize the responsibility to build up the masses. And you can see this the emphasis on the public schooling, increasing schooling wherever possible, lift up the bottom instead of looking down on the bottom. And so they write out from the Torah, for example, the obligation to teach and make the Seder into a teaching moment, the Gavah you shall tell your child. That means everybody teaches, teaches, teaches. And from the Shema, where it says, Vishinantam Levanacha, you repeat it to your child, they take the next step, which means teach it to your child, right? Education, education. We have the beginnings of school systems, public schooling, before the temple fell, before the second temple fell. It were not to create degrees, but to create values. Now, in the process of creating the values, they did teach reading, literary skills. They did teach analytic skills. They did teach skills about property. They did teach skills of fair usage of coinage, rules of weights and measures, legal rights and obligations, right? So one was getting in this teaching very worldly information as well. For the masses, for the masses. All of this is now going to be taught to the masses, the emphasis to the masses. Um, the, in Babylonia, they, they, they had the practice of Yechekala, that they would have a month where people would just drop their business and come to the academy and join in mass public teachings. And again, those who are more sophisticated would take the more advanced classes. Those are the simpler folks. They take more of the Midrash, nice stories and legends. Uh, but it was being spread. That's the whole point. Right? Uh, and it's, yeah. No, so we've got to reach out to the... Uh, Rabbi Akiva is the case in point. He's the illiterate shepherd, right? And, well, he goes breaks out on his own to do it at great cost. Hillel comes... He's wealthy, but he's not educated. He breaks because of wealthy cost. But there are many stories of people who have no money, and they scrape together every penny to be able to go to the academies. And later generations, it was everybody everywhere would scrape together their pennies, to take the child to the teacher starting with the age of three. And whether it's in the uh, Hudson Klutz in Poland or in uh, Yemen or wherever, going to the Chayda Malamed or to the Mori, right? Starting, right? All the way. So then also is the questioning. I said, right, the mission starts with questioning. So we, we learned this idea of Shaklavataria, you give and take in the discussion. Alachat kama bekama, which is the Latin equivalent of a fortiori. If, uh, if uh, in one case, then how much more so in the stronger case? Uh, a hekesh, a syllogism or analogy. If this is like this, then this is like this, right? That's all part of the education. Uh, and also the recognition that in the debate, you very often get the answer teku. Teku in Israeli soccer games, teku is when the teams can't, right, they tie. Means uh, tekum, it's a short for tekum, let it stand. 
I'll, I'll the answer, a classic example, is it's really the uh, abbreviation for Tishbi Avov Yotoshev Elijah comes at the end of days, then he'll answer this question, which means we cannot always get to an answer. We have to recognize that. So this would not be a religion for people looking for answers to simple slogans. So one could be very wealthy, but be looked down upon as an amoritz, ignoramus. In fact, the word amhaaretz meant the, land, the landlord, the owner of wealthy properties who was not educated. That's how we get the word ignoramus. Whereas the poorers would scrape their pennies together to attend the academies. They become the ones who are honored. And we have no concept of the pious fool, which appears in medieval Christian thought. The sum of it is in Hasidic stories, because Hasidism was trying to reach out to very poor Jews who felt abandoned by the academies in Lithuania, the north. But that's a whole different story. But it is because pure faith was central to Christianity. Whereas the center of Judaism would be a reasoned faith, one that had been argued out and based on learning and behavior based on learning. Right? Therefore, the average Jewish boy was literate, and then so was the actually many Jewish women. Although there wasn't the formal learning, we do know the Jewish women could read and write both in Europe and in the unlike the population of women. Right. So in Egypt, we know from the Egyptian uh, Cairo Geniza, there were women who headed academies, there were women who ran businesses, they wrote documents, legal documents. All right. So uh, although it was a little bit more widespread in Ashkenaz than in the Arab world, still, this was this presence of learning, whether it's written learning or oral learning. All right. It was, uh, all right. Here's the emphasis was for the girls, they would learn those parts of Jewish law that were relevant to running the household. That would be the key difference. So look how the learning goes. At three, the child will be sent to Cheder. And you give the child a blackboard and you write on the blackboard the opening verses of Leviticus. And then you cover it with honey and you give the child the blackboard and says, enjoy the honey, lick the honey. All right? And they say, we want you to know that when you read Torah, it's sweet as honey. All right? That's how you introduce education to the child. Or my father said, how did the Malama teach him? He says, we take the, the letters and there's a chayla aleph, chayla base, a little animal aleph, a little animal base. Uh, and the Talmud records one teacher who goes to heaven and said, what did you merit to go to heaven? He says, I had a little fish pond in my backyard. And every time the child would learn a letter, I'd let him go out to the pond and play with the fish. Right? The idea of you need reward. The, and there's always the story of the Malama smacking the kid on the wrist, uh, you know, a little too hard. But it, the emphasis was on using positive learning, making it something positive. And then the child would go home and everybody asked, what, what did you learn? What did you learn? And the child would have to answer, right? So there was an encouragement. Everybody on the street, stranger on the street, what did you learn today? So the child was, realized this is something valuable. Right, Pirkei Avod gives the life cycle, right? At five mikra, by five, you've learned how to read, you should now start reading the Torah, studying it. 10 Mishnah, the key components of Jewish observances. Uh, 13, you carry it out, right? 15, study Talmud, analysis, critical thinking theory, all right? Go ahead, a little few other points and then I'm gonna wrap up. What's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. So the guy was hired a. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So it, it, don't, it goes back to the Babylonians, much older. You know, the Babylonians go, go 2,000 years before the Greeks, right? So everybody knew that. 
Zodiac was science of its day. That's all it was, it was science of its day. So they had no compunction about using the images and so on, the pictures and so around them. They probably hired a, 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 you know, a nice artist from the next village, come do this for me. One of Zodiac, in the middle of the Zodiac is Apollo the sun god. Right. Yeah, because how else are you gonna depict the, the, the sun, the chariot? Okay, so nah, give me a nice picture, right? Give me a nice picture. Uh, they're much more latitudinarian, let's say, when it comes to the graphic arts, so that one of the rabbis is asked when the temple still stands, um, is Roman, one of the rabbi Gamaliels, and uh, they said he goes to the Roman bathhouse. The Roman bathhouse is filled with idols. So he says, well, wait a minute, why did they put those idols there? Are they, did they put them there for me to honor the idols? Or did they put those beautiful statues there to honor me? They're for my enjoyment, right? A very different understanding. Islam takes it much more strictly. Much more strictly. Representative arts are, are yeah, yeah. Well, no, they're not in the temple, in the bathhouse. The, oh, in the synagogue, yeah. Right, yeah. So you can use figurative arts. Uh, later on, uh, you'll see synagogues that did have also illustrations, mostly, mostly animals. Not human beings, not illustrations of human beings. We see like animal figures and so on. Different periods are a little bit more strict. You have illustrations in manuscripts uh, where human beings have bird, bird heads. They didn't want to do two figures. But like I said, it's very different than Islam, where all your art had to be abstract art. Abstract art, using letters of the Arabic alphabet or geometric patterns, because you took the command not to make images far more, far more extreme than Jews did, far more extreme. The exception to be Iranians who used a figure a human illustration, right? And as you go further, uh, further east, use human figures, right? Like, well, let me just wrap up here. So, but it's a good question. Yeah, right. Justinian. Uh -huh. no, Justinian. Yeah, the Justinian code. Yeah, it's about uh, 400, 500, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was one of the very anti Semitic uh, emperors, by the way. It was Justinian code, which has severe restrictions on Jews. Yeah. And that's the way you have the downfall of. Yeah. Yeah, I said that's, yeah, because that's the sun. What are you going to do? Does it say the, the, the chariot? Yeah, it's got the sun chariot. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Fivel, Yiddish name Fivel, I've, I've heard, is, is a corruption of Phoebus Apollo. Phoebus Apollo becomes Fivel. I can pick uh, names from around you. Esther, our great hero. What's, what's the name Esther? Ishtar. That's the name Mordechai, Marduk. But you pick up what's from around you. What you do is you circumcise it. You make it Jewish. That's basically what we did. Oh, it's, it's circumcised. Okay. Okay, there we go. That's right. That's right. So I just want to wrap up. Just want to wrap up and get to it. All right, so we, we are, we've always been open to outside ideas. And we give it a Jewish face. That's what we do. Uh, just to add, 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 in creating and, and learning society, the ideal match for the daughter of the wealthy would not the Tove Ha'ir or the Parnas would be the Tamil Chacham, right? The Eloi of the Yeshiva, the bright boy of the Yeshiva. That's what you want for your match. And so for a successful merchant who didn't have, to have let's say, a head for academics, his great honor would be the one paying for the yeshiva, all right? Uh, and uh, I'll just wrap up this wonderful quotation from Nikita Khrushchev, who could not stand Jews. He did everything to try to get Jews out of the Soviet uh, regime because he realized that all the party heads were married to Jews. He just couldn't stand it, including his own daughter-in-law, I think was married to some Jewish. Anyway, he complains about Jews. They're all individualists and all intellectuals. They want to talk about everything. They want to discuss everything. They want to debate everything. 
and they come to totally different conclusions. That's it. That's what frustrates the world around us. Okay, so that is how we get to Torah. Okay. So to everybody, a good Shabbos, and we're going to try, what is this mushroom bolognese? Okay, very good. See, we... Salmon comes with what? Oh, bones, bones, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, okay. So you've been duly advised and warned. Uh, okay. And uh, all right, to everybody, a good Shabbos to all of you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom. Zehu Zeh.